Step inside the fictional bookshop, an immersive storytelling experience for book lovers. Explore the first chapter of your next favorite book, from epic adventures to fantastic worlds to cozy characters. This week, the fictional bookshop has a copy of Lord of the Hollow Court by C.K. Began. You wander down a narrow, cobblestone street under the cloak of All Hallows' Eve night. Leaves rustle underfoot and the moon casts a spectral glow on the lamplit streets. On the next block over, you spy a large building looming above the square, its lights blazing out into the darkness. The gothic building beckons you closer the second you spot books through the windows. You reach the door and turn the handle. Stepping over the threshold, you spot the shopkeeper by the register, a dark gray cat sleeping at their feet. You nod and head down the nearest aisle, unsure of what you're searching for. Dust dances in the air, stirred by your presence, as you haunt the aisles, lamps flickering overhead. A certain book on a shelf draws your attention, and you reach up to get it, but someone grabs your hand. Not that one, the shopkeeper says, causing you to jump. Here, I think you'll like this one. A black book with autumn leaves and rings on the front is pushed into your hands, and the shopkeeper is gone. You glance around for somewhere to peruse the book. A spindly chair at the end of the aisle will do, so you sit down with a creak of wood and open up the book to read. Chapter 1. Ill Omens Brom, Lord of the Hollow Court, strode through the foyer of Hollow Hall, hand grasping the raven head of his walking stick and sharp eyes missing nothing. Though the rugged contours of his tawny features remained serene, he noted every strand of web, every bejeweled bat wing suspended from the pillars and the black bowers draped across every arched doorframe. Much of it he found lacking. More glamour in the glamours, Misman, he told his butler, wrapping the cane on the beachy travertine stone tiles. Hollow Hall must seem as rich as the best courts of our size. Not for the first time, Brom wondered whether he ought to glamour the tiles to appear as an autumnal forest floor instead of the ever-present mist he had already decided upon. The pigeon-blood ruby on his finger weighed more heavily tonight, the gold band like a vice. Had it ever been such a weight on his father's finger? He longed to know, to have the counsel of anyone who'd stood in his position before. Far too much depended on tonight, with too little time remaining to remedy any errors. Misman inclined his head toward his lord. The servants are confused, my lord. They were under the impression the Samhain revel should be frightening. I believe your lordship requested a haunted graveyard theme. Brahm replied with a brow. I want it as resplendent as a fey lord's tomb. A hint of threat flashed across his features. All I see here is a pathetic human graveyard. Of course, sir, Misman said, bowing quickly though his brow arched in a tacit reminder that Brahm was behaving badly. Brahm made no attempts to correct his behavior. After weeks of planning, he simply could not manage one more thing, least of all his own moods. This night teetered on the brink of disaster. Raking his fingers through his blue-black hair, Brahm stalked into the throne room, irritation twisting his features. His cane beat a rapid rat-a-tat upon the tile as he moved, an indicator on his hips better days of his temperament. As the Samhain revel drew near, and perhaps his court's final hours with it, the servants had long since learned to scatter depending on the cadence. Thus, he saw no one as he walked, though the pine and dew scents of pixies hung fresh in the air. He suspected they were hiding behind the garland of poison-dripping apples. Not only were the fae of the other courts soon to arrive, including the high fae who so looked down upon the hollow court, he had a petitioner. Who among the folk he ruled would be foolish enough to trouble him today? As Brahm slipped through a heavily webbed door, a glittering spider fell to the floor with a clang. Perfect. With the help of his silver-buckled shoe, he swept it toward himself and plucked it from the sand-colored tile. It was a fair piece of low fay craftwork from the only category of fair folk permitted to craft. Coated in druzy, smoky quartz, he thought the spider an elegant little thing and just the touch his costume needed for tonight. Brahm tightened his grip on the head of his cane as he took in the surrounding decor with fresh eyes. I've behaved poorly, he admonished himself, and have since the letter arrived. Every detail made his tyrannical ways more evident. His folk within Hollow Hall and without it knew the importance of tonight without such harsh reminders, each of them bearing the weight of the high phase attention this soured night. 
they were as painfully aware as their lord that this would be their final chance to prove their worth to the council. Each element of the decor represented hours of work by dozens of hands. Misman had seen to it that hundreds of little crafts lay around the hollow hall, so many placed casually or half-hidden, as if the hollow court was so rich with craft they need not prominently display it like the high fae with their prizes. A collection of golden goblets on a side table were set with step-cut rubies, the collaboration of both jeweler and smith, then enchanted by Brahm himself to appear to drip with blood. The webs were spun from diamonds from Herkimer Village, the bat wings sewn from heavy velvet. His people had made an admirable effort, an exceptional one, it might be said. So why did Brahm suspect it wouldn't be enough? With a huff, Brahm stalked into his throne room, throwing open the double doors to make room for him and his cane. The entire T-shaped room was made up as a dragon's lair, hollow halls decorative steel weapons enchanted to flow fresh blood from gleaming edges, though in truth they were dull to the touch. Above it all, an impressive dragon skeleton with black moonstone bones hung suspended from the upper balcony. Another glamour, rather than an expensive import from the Thorn Forest Court of Madagascar, whose lady preferred bargains over coin. Hours had gone into every detail of the creature, with craftsfolk from Bugard pouring into the manor every morning to get it right. The dragon was all the more genius because the bulk of tonight's guests would never find their way here. When they did, their delighted screams would surely reach the high fate ears in the ballroom. The ballroom itself had a flock of bone and garnet wyverns still being strung by fairy servants and citrine lava men crawling from the floor. Some had spellwork upon them to travel the length of Hollow Hall, surprising and hopefully tripping some of the guests. Misman had come up with the idea of random patches of slime to follow them. There were two dozen hands prepared to spring from the walls, eyes that would float after guests, and bats to chase them out of restricted wings, each one a combination of craft and glamour. Those who went further would find themselves beset by a murder of crows so lifelike they could peck holes in the offender's tails or gown. These were the sorts of thrills everyone expected from Hollow Hall, as if it was a carnival attraction and not a proper fay court. Yet, if Brahm did not deliver, the pressure to be absorbed into the Court of Claws was bound to push the Hollow Court to the breaking point. Thus, he was hardly in the mood for petitioners when he settled onto his throne, which was already glamoured by him to appear made of human bones. Brahm tossed his cane from one hand to the other, then, crossing ankle over knee, balanced it across his lap. Everything needed to be perfect tonight. He had not a moment to spare for this ill-timed fool. It was all the more unfortunate, then, that his petitioner was High Fay, or something rather like it. His height gave him away, and the soft blue-gray hue of his skin, but there was a low fayness to him and perhaps a humanness in him, too. Brahm could see it plainly in his limp. A full-blooded High Fay would heal far more quickly than that, whereas Brahm's hip and the havoc it wreaked on the leg below it were proof of the low Fay's inferior healing abilities. The man wore a hood as he approached, not having the decency to remove it. Immediately sensing a trick, Brom did not shut the doors to the throne room with his magic, letting the hidden pixies in the hall keep their eyes on the proceedings within. Reliable as ever, Misman appeared moments later, hovering at the door. A touch of wickedness curved the line of Brom's lips. Whatever this high fay was up to, Misman was more than capable of handling it. As if aware of the additional eyes upon him, the petitioner pulled his cloak tight. He approached Brahm's dais, his right foot dragging just a touch behind him, physical ailments being common amongst both Demi and Lofe, though peculiarly he used no walking stick to assist him. If Brahm's courtiers were in the balcony instead of the pulley system for the bone dragon, they would have jeered at the man for pretending he needed no walking aid. His people resented the high fay stigma regarding the human-like frailties of the low fay. Not using a support when one needed one was practically rude. When the man neared, Brahm saw the frayed edges of the petitioner's cloak and the stains upon its hem. What sort of high fay was he to appear before a court's lord in such a state? Well, if the man was searching for sympathy, he would not find it in Brahm. This was not just a petitioner before him. This was a traveler. Brahm would bet the dregs of his fortune he didn't belong to a court, and this was no time to have trouble from one of the free fay. Brahm shifted uncomfortably on his gruesome throne. Between the shape of the supplicant's bony nose and the cunning glimmer in his black, beady eyes that Brahm did not quite trust, this fay had a decidedly rat-like appearance. Brahm would remember that face if he'd ever seen it before. He was certainly not a subject of the hollow court. For the fay, unexpected travelers were always an ill omen, and Brahm needed no more of them tonight. 
What business do you have with me? Brahm asked peevishly. A slow grin spread from the traveler's angular features. I come not with business, but with a bargain, he replied. Brahm leaned against the arm of his throne, the glamour giving way, so he perceived the plush velvet beneath. He was not impressed. I am not inclined toward any bargains. But you must hear this one, the traveler said, mouth turning down in a frown pronounced by unfay-like lines. With the usual drama of the high fay, he lowered his hood with a painstaking slowness. Brahm shot forward on his throne, nearly dislodging his cane. A crescent of pockmarks curved down the man's cheek onto the smooth grayness of his jaw. A handful of the pox had made it to his neck. He had the fay wasting. Away from me, Brahm shouted, wincing as he rolled to standing, unintentionally spearing himself with the pain from his hip. He grappled for his cane as it clattered onto the dais, the tile most likely cracked beneath the round of carpet. The traveler laughed harshly. Peace, Lord Brahm. In all of my studies, I have not encountered one of your descent with the wasting. It infects only those descended from the elder courts, whose court's magic is not strong enough to protect it. He means the colonizers. Brahm leaned back, uneasy. Like so many fey in the oldest, smallest courts of what was lately called the United States, he had a more than generous helping of old-world blood in his family line, leaving him with little more than a touch of orium in his complexion from the now-near-mythical golden fey of the Americas. He was far less confident about the distinction this traveler made. How much colonizer blood was too much? Clearly, stronger courts like the once mighty Roanoke had not been spared, its bones transformed into an English settlement that had fared much better. As far as Brahm was concerned, no low or demi fay was safe from the wasting. This traveler had brought far worse than an ill omen into his court. Brahm caught Misman's eye, urging the butler to keep his distance. Behind him, the pixies fled from the hall in a flurry of flitting double wings. The free fay were unpredictable at best, and known to be careless like this, a grimace remained on Brahm's face. I have the wasting, as you can see, the traveler said, but I hold too much magic for it to conquer me. Brahm's grimace faltered. How can that be? The man was pale as flower. I am a sorcerer, trained by the masters of the elder courts, the man replied. I have heard of the colonial court's sickness and came to study it only to catch it myself. So it is I have a bargain to offer. I know the whereabouts of the diadem known as the heart of Lindendam. My mother's diadem, Brahm said at once, focus narrowing on the rat-like high fay. Slowly, he returned to his throne, sitting with an angry twinge of nerve pain in his leg. His eyes did not leave the traveler the entire time. It has not been seen in a century. How is it you know its location? All magic has a signature, the fay sorcerer said a touch smugly. Could high demi fay lie? There were too few of them to know. That sounded like an evasion to Brahm as if the sorcerer knew the family's heirloom's whereabouts, but not its exact location. Besides, there was something in his smile that was too oily for Brahm to like, yet the lure of the diadem, said to be imbued with the magic of the elder courts before the fae crossed the Atlantic, was too strong to dismiss. He had a court to save, after all, and the fae wasting to keep out. He found himself scowling at the sorcerer. And you can trace this signature? Brahm pressed him, arching a skeptical brow. Is that what you suggest? The face sorcerer bowed his head. I know of its location. I would procure it myself, except it is not mine to take. How convenient. Tell me, Brahm demanded. Ah, but that would require a bargain. Sorcerers rarely give such valuable information for naught. Brahm's expression shuddered. He was the lord of the hollow court. He would not risk his folk and his seat in a bargain with a high face sorcerer. I am lord of this land, and the diadem is rightly mine. I will make no bargain for its return. Then you will not hear my terms? The sorcerer asked, his dark eyes utterly unreadable. Something that was not pity stirred in Brahm. His foul mood curled around him like a serpent, its fangs turning inward on him until he felt a wicked plan taking shape. Why not pretend to hear the man's offer? There was something greater afoot here. Brahm leaned back, inclining his head ever so slightly to indicate he should proceed. I will tell you the location of the diadem, the sorcerer said, and in exchange you will allow me to heal myself completely from its powers. Further still, I must be allowed to study it to find the means to cure the infected. 
and if that cure requires you to draw from its power further. The rat-like fay tilted his head. What consequence is that when the diadem's return will surely elevate your court? A shudder ran through Brom. This was some trick of the high fay, some effort to keep him out. He would not show how desperate he was. Brom stood, free hand curled into a fist. The knuckles around the polished head of his cane became so bloodless his hand was translucent as selenite. You would dare to bargain for what's rightfully mine, and so brazenly, too? He would make the high fay rue the day they sought to trick him. I find I have an entirely different bargain for you. Brom drew himself up. He might not be high fay, but he was something just as good a golden fay court's lord who drew from the power of the bountiful nature around him. Until this moon has vanished from the sky, Brom declared, a golden sheen of magic twining around his hands, I curse you to the shape of a beast of burden. The smarmy mask the sorcerer wore shattered, his eyes widened, panic gripping him. For just a moment, Brom's heart squeezed. As a horse, the sorcerer would be unlikely to spread the fay wasting. Still, Brom recognized the flaw in its worst form. A vile instinct led him to take this punishment a step too far. How much longer could he behave like this, always acting on impulse, always quick to react to every slight, before he was as terrible as the Lady of the Court of Claws? Unkind, my lord, the Fae Sorcerer protested as the swirling golden light began to distend, trickling toward him. I have come to you in the spirit of true bargain. I would not make such a mistake. And I would not threaten the lord of the hollow court. With a bellow of what might well be a ruinous temper, the curse flew toward the face sorcerer like spirits on the sacred night, surrounding him and worming through the fibers of his cloak. As every thread of it vanished, a black horse grew from the tatters. The horse neighed and bucked, eyes rolling to reveal their whites, hind legs kicking out as they took shape. You shall be a wonderful surprise for anyone who strays into my throne room, Brom declared, knowing that anyone was sure to be the other court's lords and ladies. He closed the double doors with a flick of his hand, ignoring the wariness on Mismond's face as they slammed together. Kane tapping upon the stone dais, Brom smiled to himself, pleased with his own cleverness. With one last glance at the sorcerer turned stallion, now rearing at the unfairness of it all, Brom let himself out through the door behind his throne. He wished to check on the kitchen phase progress before the first of his guests arrived. You close the book, Lord of the Hollow Court, by C.K. Began, and tuck it under your arm. As you approach the till, the shopkeeper grins a haunting smile. I told you, he says, giving the gray cat a head scratch. After handing over your money for the book, you head for the door. When you turn back to say goodbye to the shopkeeper, you only see the cat perched by the till. You shrug and head out the door, a soft chime sounding as the heavy door slams shut behind you. You think you hear the sound of horse hooves down the next alley, but don't see anything when you look that way. Clutching the book to your chest with a chill down your back, you glance back at the black-lettered sign above the window which reads, Fictional Bookshop. This has been Fictional Bookshop, a podcast by Liz Delton. For more about Liz, visit lizdelton.com. Lord of the Hollow Court, copyright C.K. Began, read with the author's permission. For more about the author, visit ckbegin.com. For more visits to the Fictional Bookshop, give us a follow and come back anytime to explore a new book. Next week, come back for A Curse, A Key, and A Corkscrew by Anna McCluskey. 